trying some new glasses tonight so I can see the songbook really well. Everything beyond this is blurry. <laughs> we're, so, blurry. we're blurry anyway. Well, there we go. It was blurry anyway. Let's start out this evening in the red book. We're going to sing number 114, I Want to Be a Worker for the Lord. Number 114 in the red book. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
struggling. So, so a lot of pain in the knee? Oh, yeah, it still uh, hurts. The swelling is still pretty bad. Yeah, she still needs to be had. Okay, let's pray for Charmaine. How's Heather doing? Uh, good, still wearing the boot. Still still alive. Wearing the boot, yeah. That would be that way for a while. But we can still pray for her, too. Most definitely. Lola, how you doing? Oh, good, good. So, Maria, surgery, recovery, doctor's appointment, Eugene. It went well. Um, she had a, body, a full body scan on the 4th. We don't know the results of that yet. Um, she's supposed to talk on the phone with the oncologist in Eugene on the 14th. Okay. And we'll find out then if she needs to have chemo or not. Okay. Well, we'll be continue being in prayers for her. Uh, Barbara, how's your search for a house going? Let's keep praying for you. Let's keep going. Uh, Jack Jr. is recovering from his surgery. Hope that's going well. Continue to pray for him. Howard needs a surgery. How's that going? Still working on those blood tests. Okay, okay. He, he's got to get it up before he can get in surgery. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, let's just continue to pray for Howard and his health. Um, our granddaughter Lilia, back on crutches, is going to need a surgery. Yeah, we, we just need to keep praying for her. It's, it's hard for a teenage girl to have to go through knee surgery. Lawrence, how's Joyce doing? Okay. Well, let's continue to be in prayer for her. How are you doing over there? I'm uh, doing good, except my right remained on. We went out to the window and it went off. My right remained on for, for a little bit. On your car? Yeah. Oh. I don't know what it's like in there. Oh. Well, I'm not a car guy at all. <laughs> that definitely sounds like a problem. Got to keep on top. Make sure that doesn't kill your battery. I can face that one. Stay on until one. Uh, well, some cars are made that way. <laughs> but if it hasn't done it before and just started doing this, that's probably a problem. Mm -hmm. We'll be a prayer for you and your vehicle. Um, Jerry not feeling well. It's about the bottom of the list here. Oh, Harry's uncle Bobby is in the hospital. Needs prayer, fighting cancer. Lola's mother passed away. Very sorry for your losses. I understand there's uh, something on the bulletin in the back about the memorial. Is that? Oh, okay. It's going to be at the Light Mountain Church. Okay. Up there. Up there. Next Thursday. Next Thursday. Well, that about takes us to the bottom of the list here. I just Susan? mentioned the doctor my name, so we thought I'd sprain my left ankle, <coughs> I mean, on the heel part. And oh. so I thought I just don't walk quite as much and ride my bike. <laughs> okay. But anyway, yeah. Well, about that, six weeks. Is <laughs> there you go. At least the, guy, the doctor sent you in the right direction. Yeah. Stay off of it for a little bit. Yeah, almost impossible. Yeah, check. I'm grinning from ear to ear. Do you want to know why? I would love to know why. I'm going to be a Grammy again. Woo woo! Where are you hearing this from? Which one? Devin. Devin. Oh, wow. I know that. Glad to hear Devin's having a death. Very cool. Very good news. That's a blessing. We didn't hear what it was. Devin's having a child. She's going to be a grandmother again. Oh. <laughs> uh, sometime soon or just just the beginning? Uh, Jordan said she's due May 24th. Okay. So we're just getting the start of it here. May 24th. May 24th. Well, good, good. That is wonderful news. Glad to hear it. Anything else? If not, Tom, you want to start us off on our evening prayer? And I'll finish it off when we're done. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful that we can be here this evening. We can sing praises to you your messages from your word, Lord, and your prayer meetings, Father. We're thankful, Father, that we can come to you in prayer and that you listen to our prayers, Father, and answer our prayers, Lord. We continue to pray.
Father, we thank you for the time you have know, given us here to spend this lovely and wonderful church. We pray for all the people in this church that are so lovely and we thank you for them. We pray especially for the individual folks who have illness or inconvenience. We treat you with them properly. We thank you for so much for the time you've given us here. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Heavenly Father.
Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all your blessings. You, you do so much for us every day of our life. Every breath we draw is from you, and we thank you, Lord. We know you are our God in the mountains and in the valleys. We thank you for all the blessings, answered prayers, so many praises that lift up to you. All these new babies, thank you, dear Lord, the ones that are here and the ones to come. Thank you so much. Thank you for that new life. We thank you for the times through those hard valleys, too. We pray that you'll be with those grieving, lost, struggling, dear Lord, and so many. We need your help. We pray that you'll be with all those that need your help and your healing touch. We pray especially you be with Carrie, my first brood of cancer. We have so many that are struggling right now, dear Lord. We pray that they know that you. You will guide us through all of this, like you always do, dear Lord. We pray just need your strength and your comfort to get through this. Pray that you'll always lead us, help us to be shining lights in the world for you. Help us to be an example to others. Help us to show your love. Help us to always be that good servant to you. Pray that you'll guide us, keep us safe, lead us in your way always. We pray in Jesus' name. Well, we're going to finish up Galatians tonight. Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word which we can put Paul and put through this letter and be able to understand it better. And the Spirit has been guiding us along the way. We just pray again that you would help us to understand the, the ending here as we close up the book. And Pray that you would just enlighten us this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Galatians 6, verse 11. Paul says, See what large letters I use to write to you with my own hand. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except for in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world was crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. The Israel to the Israel of God from now on. Let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the grand marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Brothers and sisters, amen. Well, uh, this conclusion is not like uh, any of uh, Paul's other conclusions. 
Normally he uh, concludes with some greetings like greet so-and-so and that kind of thing. There's kind of this interchange of people. And he knew a lot of people up there because he started a lot of the, or all of the churches up in Galatia. Um, but uh, most scholars think this is his first letter. So it's he's doing things a little bit differently. Um, and uh, what he does in Galatians, uh, he doesn't do anywhere else. And he kind of goes back to the, the start, you know, regarding the, the main issues that he was talking about. Which is a lot, I mean, it's kind of how they tell you to do the paper in school. In your conclusion, you know, talk about what you, sum up what you've been talking about. And so, uh, and that's what he does here. So, you know, we've heard it before, but... So he's reminding us again, because he did kind of go on some rabbit trails and some different topics and things, and but, you know, so we kind of forget about what his, his main point was. Um, so he ends by saying, you know, that again, that these are dangerous people that have come into your church, um, and you need to be aware of them, and you need to understand the cross, and the, the meaning of the cross and the gospel and the, the impact of that. So in verse 11, starts off by saying uh, um, that this, this final message was written by him. You know, he says, see what large um, letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. So Paul used... He wrote many letters, uh, I can't remember how many at this time, but a lot, a lot of the New Testament epistles were Paul's, but he always used that amanuensis, and this is uh, somebody that would, you know, write the letter for him. Maybe somebody that had good penmanship, so they could actually read the letter when they get it. <laughs> you have to write one for me, for sure. I know, me too, yeah. Well, I, I gave up writing in cursive a long time ago because when I wrote in cursive, I, when I went back, I could never read what I wrote. <laughs> so now I print it, but even sometimes with printing, I have a little bit of trouble, so I have to be careful. But. So I know what Paul is talking about here. Um, so he had this scribe, but then at the end of his letters, he would always take the pen and write a few words just so you would know it was Paul, you know, because everyone knew his handwriting and he had these large letters and, and you know, so that they would recognize, you know, this isn't some, um, you know, imposter or, uh, you know, somebody that's imposter, you know, that's uh, come along and trying to act like he's Paul. But, um, so, uh, he says uh, in, uh, in, in the book of 2 Thessalonians, we, we went through that book, but in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3 and verse 17, um, he says, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all of my letters. This is how I write. So in that letter, he said, that he always does this in every letter. Now, he doesn't always say that he's doing it in every letter. He says it in Galatians, and he says it in Thessalonians and a couple other things. But but in the letter of Thessalonians, he says, I always, you know, in my letters, in my own handwriting. So I, and I think it was just to authenticate, you know, that it's always him that's writing it. Um, And uh, he also always ends with grace be with you or something to that effect. That's always something that Paul says at the end of his letters. Um, but in Galatians, he says, see what large letters I write to you with my own hand. So why the large letters? Um, so there's been some speculation on this. Um, like I've already mentioned, you know, maybe his penmanship wasn't very good. Um, but another suggestion is a lot of people think that Paul had eye problems because of some of the things that happened in the book of Acts and whatnot. And so if he had eye problems, 
Well, there's one theory too that you know when uh, he was blind on the road of Damascus, God gave him back his sight, but maybe God, you know, he didn't have the sight he used to have to maybe remind him, you know, of that day. It's a possibility, you know, but he always talked about it, that he did have an issue with his eyes and things like that. So this is another thing that may be an indication of that, you know, that he had poor eyesight and that's why he always had to have someone write the letters for him. And also, if you have poor eyesight, why he's writing in such big letters, you know, maybe because he can't see it unless it's really big. So that could be a reason too. Um, And then, uh, then he moves to uh, to the conclusion. Just like I said, kind of re-emphasizing what he's been saying in this letter. He's been speaking of these Judaizers, and that's why he, you know, began this whole thing in the first place. So re-emphasizing that, um, uh, you know, the motivations and, uh, that they had for doing such a thing, and the, the method, the methods that they're using. You know, they were concerned about external things, and that's what he said in verse 12. He says, those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. So these Judaizers, they were just concerned with the outward things, you know. Um, if you can get circumcised, you know that that was enough for them. You know, as long as you were circumcised, okay, you're in, and that's all they really cared about. They didn't really care about where your heart was at. You know, which was the main thing. And uh, so they were just kind of concerned about some of the outward rituals. And um, so that's what Paul is saying. And then secondly, um, they were kind of spiritual cowards, you know, because they're, they're not doing, you know, they're a little, a little bit afraid here of being persecuted. They don't stand up for the cross of Christ or saying that that's why that they're believers um, because that's going to get them persecuted. And so they're not willing to go that extra mile. So in the end of verse 12, he says, the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. So basically, I think what Paul is referring to is if, you know, he went back to Jerusalem, remember these guys came from Jerusalem, um, and there were some legalistic Jews from Jerusalem. And so if he went back to Jerusalem from, from the Galatia area, there was so, remember there's several churches in this, Paul's writing this letter too. It's not just one church, but at least I think five or six churches uh, in that area. But uh, if they went back to, you know, uh, Jerusalem, and they said that they had been witnessing to these Galatians, but that they hadn't been circumcised, um, then they were they were gonna you know kind of get it for not getting circumcised because I think that was kind of their main mission to make sure they were circumcised. Because remember there was that whole debate whether you were really a believer if you were circumcised or not, and this was a debate that was in the Book of Acts, and also you know here Paul has been emphasizing it quite a bit over and over in this letter. But that was a concern because a, a lot of people believed you had to be circumcised in order to be a believer. But Paul says emphatically, no, you don't. And that's one of the main reasons he wrote this letter. But if he could go back to Jerusalem and say, hey, we got all these people to be circumcised, then they would get brownie points from their buddies down there. You know, so, so I think that, um, that that's, you know, was kind of their main agenda. Um, but, you know, if they went back and didn't have that information, they would just said, well, the, Christ, the cross of Christ is enough, then they probably would have got some persecution for that. And they're not willing to, to do that. So they're kind of cowards in a way. Um, so, uh, so Paul talks about how the Christ is, or the, the, the cross of Christ is, is the main thing, you know, it's about what Christ did on the cross. Um, you know, that he took our place and and uh, paid the penalty, and uh, that was, that was, you know, the main message of the cross, that we have forgiveness now because of Jesus taking our place. 
We have eternal life now because of what Jesus has done for us. Um, and Paul basically points out that they, these guys are hypocrites in verse 13. He says, not even those who are circumcised obey the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. So, you know, they're circumcised, but they're not following the, all of the law. Of course, like Paul's been writing in this letter, nobody can follow the law. It's impossible. Paul said, I think I probably came closer than anybody else, but he said, I couldn't even do it. <laughs> but uh, nobody can follow the law, and that's why, you know, the law doesn't work. But he's saying, you know, that they're going around saying, you need to follow the law, you need to be circumcised, and yet they're not following the law. So they're, they're hypocrites in that way. Um, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> Jesus also, many, many times over, uh, said the same thing about the Pharisees, that they were hypocrites. You know, they had certain rules and regulations that they would do. A lot of it was for show on the outside, kind of like these guys are wanting to do. Um, but the inside, he said, on the, he called them like a, Cup that you wash on the outside, but don't wash the inside, which is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Imagine doing your dishes and just washing the cup on the outside. <laughs> and Jesus was saying they're like that. They're not even washing the inside, they're just doing all these things on the outside to appear to everybody that they're, they have their lives together. But really, they're inside, they're full of corruption. And so that's kind of what Paul is getting at here. They're, they're not concerned about the inner things. Um, so Paul says, you, you guys need to know, you know who you're dealing with. These guys are, are crooked. Um, and then Paul shifts and he starts, he's speaking about himself. Um, but he's also trying to show how Christians need to understand this. So he says, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So, you know, the, the cross was a symbol of shame. It was a symbol of disgrace. And, he, and Paul talked about that in the book of, of Corinthians, that it's foolishness, you know, um, to the Gentiles um, and a stumbling block to the Jews. Um, and it just didn't make sense. The cross didn't make sense to them. And it was a symbol of, it was a symbol of shame. And that's what Jesus did on the cross was he bore our shame. He went through all of that. And it's also a symbol of, um, you know, brutality, even horror. I mean, the way that they went about it is, uh, it's really graphic to, to witness such a thing, you know. So Paul says, um, but I'm going to boast in that because Paul is looking past the horror of it all and seeing what God sees, that it was necessary that Jesus went through all those horrible things and took the shame and was lifted up. Jesus himself said, if I be lifted up, I will draw him into myself. So he was giving a reference of the crucifixion when he said that. And, and that it was a shameful thing, a horrible thing, a disgrace, but because of that, that's what gave us uh, forgiveness, eternal life through Jesus. Um, so Paul is doing the opposite of them, and he says, I'm, I'm going to boast in this, you know, this horrific thing of the, of the cross, because he realized that it was the one thing that's necessary. And it's really the, the main thing that he always wanted to preach about, too. Um, now, he doesn't want to glory in the crucifixion part of it. That's not what he's trying to say, but just in what it results in, you know. Um, lifting up Jesus, that he became our Savior, and, and what, what it meant for us, that we can be redeemed, that we can have salvation, be reconciled to the Father, and all of those things, finding forgiveness, finding purpose, giving for we become a new creation in Christ. I mean, just, just the list goes on. There's just so many things that the cross uh, does for us. And Jesus is the one that made it all happen. And so that's, uh, you know, that's what he's, he's saying. 
Um, as I said earlier, remember in chapter 2, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. That's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Well, that's, I, I, you know, that's a good one to memorize where he kind of sums it all up. One we've heard before many times. But, uh, and that's basically what he's saying here, just not as poetically, but, you know, just, uh, you know, this is what God has done. He, he loved me enough to come down to earth to die for me and to give me a new life, to be a substitute on my part, to be a sacrifice in my place. So, um, so out of this comes, then he goes on to say that the cross basically it's done so far, so far four things. Uh, number one, um, it's not about human achievement, and he's been talking about that through this letter, because that was one thing that these Judaizers were trying to emphasize, that it, for them it was all about human achievement. And Paul's saying, no, it's about the cross, it's about Jesus. Um, and that's why he says, you know, I can't boast that anything, I can't boast in my own achievements. Um, and in chapter 3, that's when he, he makes a list of all his accomplishments in Philippians, not this letter, but Philippians chapter 3. And remember at the end, after he gave that big long list of all the things that he could brag about if he wanted to, he says, whatever was a gain to me, I now count as a loss for the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered all the loss of all things. And now I count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So all of his achievements, he's pretty much said, they're all just rubbish because now I have Christ and that's everything. So you have your hand. Um, and then uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 verse 31 he says let him who boasts boast in the Lord and then a couple of verses later he says for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified so you know that was Paul's main message and he wasn't afraid of it uh, he didn't try to ignore the point or avoid it uh, because he might be persecuted. In fact, he always spoke about it, and he was pretty much persecuted everywhere he went because of that. But he always thought it was worth it. So the, the cross uh, eliminates all human achievements. You can't say, you know, I made it to heaven on my own achievements. It's because of Jesus. And then secondly, it also transforms our values, how we see things. You know, he says, the world was crucified to me and me to the world. So Paul says, you know, I, I died to all those old values, those things that I used to hold on to. I died to those. And now we're a new people who we walk in a new way of life. We're a new creation. Verse 15, he says, so neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but what counts is a new creation. So that's the main thing, you know, it's not it's no longer about circumcision or uncircumcision. And that's just one thing, I mean, you could say other things like kosher foods or the list goes on. But the circumcision was the big one for them, you know, and that's why he keeps bringing up it. But it was a work that you would do in the flesh and uh, Paul says, it doesn't matter anymore. You, you don't have to be circumcised to be a Christian for God to love you and to be a part of his family. We're a part of the new Israel now. And we don't need to be circumcised to be a part of the new Israel. At one time you did, you know. And so, but now with Christ, that no longer exists. What matters is that you're a new creation in Christ and that happens uh, because of everything that Jesus has done. So, and then he says in verse 16, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. 
Now, rule here is the word for uh, canon. Uh, and some of you may know that uh, we use the term canon of scripture. Have you ever heard that term? Yeah, when they decided, you know, which books were going to go into the scriptures. But the word canon means a standard. And that's what it means. So, like, when they were choosing the letters that went into the Bible, it had to meet a certain standard, you know, for, for them to include it in the Bible. Um, so there's, there's a certain standard, and he says, all those who follow this rule, this standard, peace and mercy will be theirs, even to the Israel of God. So um, the standard is, of course, which he's been repeating and just said, Christ being crucified on our behalf. That is the standard. That what, that's what purifies us. That's what cleanses us. So that's the basis by which we can stand before God. When we're on Judgment Day and we're standing before God, we don't say, well, because I did this and this and this. No, we say, the blood of Jesus covers my sins. Amen. That's the standard that we live by. And that's what we'll say on Judgment Day. It's the blood of Jesus, you know, that gives me just the right to be in God's presence and to enter into his throne even boldly, Paul says, but only because of his blood. So it transforms that relationship that we once had because ever since the fall, we, there was a separation from God that, that happened and we weren't allowed to go into his presence and that's why in the old system with the Jews you know there were all these protocols and you couldn't just go into the holy of holies you'd die but now we can because of Jesus blood so things things have changed now um, now he's given us a spirit and he talked about this in chapter 6 this is how we're supposed to walk and we're in harmony with the Spirit, and the Spirit will help develop in us the fruit of the Spirit. And when we have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, then we are a reflection of who Christ wants us to be. Um, and Paul says, Peace, shalom, and mercy shall be yours, even to the Israel of God, he says. So, who is the Israel of God? We are. We are the new Israel of God. And Paul talked about this in his letter over and over again. Remember, he went all the way back to uh, Sarah and Hagar, the slave woman. Remember, he spent like a whole chapter talking about that. And that we are the new Israel because we are through the line of Sarah now. We're not a part of Hagar and, and the slave woman. So it's not about the law anymore. It's about, you know, our faith in Jesus Christ. And it's, again, his blood that's covering us for our sins. And because of that, like Paul said in the book of Romans, we're grafted in like a tree branch that's grafted into the tree. Israel is that tree where the branch is grafted in. And so we are a part of Israel now. Uh, even though, even if your bloodline doesn't go back to Abraham, uh, spiritually you are, you know, if you accept Jesus Christ. So... So these Judaizers, you know, they were claiming to be the Israel of God, but they weren't the Israel of God because they weren't accepting the most important thing, which was, you know, Jesus' blood and claiming that and standing by that. No, they were saying you had to have this physical ancestry, you had to be circumcised and do all these other things in order to have salvation. So they were trusting in the old law. And Paul says, if you do that, you're worse than an unbeliever. So, you know, we can't go back to the old law. The old law, as Paul pointed out in this letter, was only just, it was only there to point us to Christ, to make us realize our sin, make us realize we needed a Savior, and then show, point us to Christ. It was never to be the, it wasn't the plan A that failed, and then so God sent Jesus. It was always to just, help us to look to Jesus because it pointed out we're sinners. That's, that was the purpose of the law. And then in verse 17, uh, Paul gives a, a final warning here. He says, finally, let no one cause me trouble. 
So these Judaizers, you know, they were causing Paul, Paul trouble because these were all Paul's babies, basically. He had started all these church plants. Now these guys are coming in and trying to undo everything he did. Um, so they've been causing Paul a lot of trouble. They're his converts. And so, and then finally he says, For I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Now this, this verse has caused a lot of uh, controversy um, because the Greek word for marks here is stigmata. Has everyone, anyone ever heard that term? If, you're, if you've been connected with the Catholic Church at all, you probably have. But stigmata is, they would say, like, if you, um, that some of the saints, you know, if they would have marks on their hands, like where Jesus' hands prints were, like it was a supernatural thing that would happen, they started bleeding from their hands, uh, that they had the stigmata of Jesus, that somehow they were marked and, you know, they were became a saint or something like that. Uh, but that's not what Paul is talking about. But uh, but that's where that word uh, that word is the word stigmata. But what he's saying is he's just saying I've got scars for Jesus Christ, and that makes me a Christian because it proves that I I've been persecuted for the Lord. You know, like when uh, guys come home from the war and they show you all their scars on their body. Hey, I got this in this place and this and this. And this is what Paul is saying. He's got all these scars all over his body. In the book of Corinthians, he makes a list of all the tortures he's been through. He's got scars to prove that he's, he's Jesus's because he's been a slave for Jesus. He's been whipped, I don't know how many times, on his back. Then he was stoned to death. He's probably got a lot of scars from being stoned to death, imagine. Um, and all the other, you know, arrests and tortures and things. He's been beaten by rods, he says. So he's got a lot of marks, you know, to prove that, that he is who he claims to be. And so that's what he's saying there, you know. He is a true disciple. And he is writing this letter because he puts it in his own penmanship there. Um, and uh, the thing about these, Ju these Judaizers, they were trying to make a big thing about being marked on the body because of circumcision. That was their thing. And I think that that's what Paul is, is getting at here. He says, you want to talk about marks? I've got marks, but they're different kinds of marks. They're marks because of being persecuted um, for the Lord Jesus. So he suffered for Christ. And then he ends this with this verse, uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, be with your spirit, uh, brothers, amen. So it's important to notice here, I think, that he still calls them brothers. I mean, he's been pretty harsh on them throughout this letter. Um, you might think that he didn't consider them brothers anymore. <laughs> Because he was really harsh with them. But he's just trying to, you know, help them to wake up and really, because they they might fall if they don't pay attention now to what he's saying. Because they've been they've been brainwashed, they've been persuaded by these Judaizers. And he says, You guys need to get back on track and remember what salvation is really about. And it's dangerous. But he still he still loves them, he's still hoping that they will, you know, change their ways get back on track what they need to do and believe in the most important thing, you know, that it's all about Christ, it's all about the cross, and, you know, his sacrifice for us. That's, that's the end of the letter. Anybody have any comments or questions? You guys are quiet tonight. <laughs> Some days you guys are talking, talking, talking. Other days you can sing. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this letter that uh, Paul has written, and it's given us so much to go by. You know, and we can get our heads turned around a little bit by some of the things that people say and. We're glad that we have all these instructions that Paul has written to all these different churches and the different scenarios and 
heresies that they struggle with, and, and uh, we just we thank you that we have these truths so that we can turn to them and and know the truth of the meaning of the cross and uh, what it implies for our life, and to not go back to the old system of the law, but to rely on Jesus and just be thankful because he is the one that's made us pure and holy and righteous to stand before you. And we thank you for all that he's done for us. Help us to never forget that. To think that we somehow did it on our own, but it was always Jesus. He's the only one that makes us righteous. And so thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that we now can go into your presence and uh, be welcome there because of his blood and that we have been provided an eternal home because of what he's done also and that even now that you've given us your spirit to guide us and to help us, console us and comfort us direct us in the way we should go so help us to be in harmony with your spirit be with us this week as we go out to the world and we listen to your voice and pay attention to your leading and we ask in Jesus name Amen. Amen. Amen.